Our guest today is a regular on the show. She's been a guest twice and contributes regularly to our Frontlines Report segment. If you've been listening to the show for a while, then she really needs no further introduction. And if you're new to Proud Nation and just tuning in, then get ready. Because our guest today is none other than Ellen Rohr. Hey, Ellen. Woo! Hey. Hi, guys. Welcome. And uh, how are you doing? I am living the dream. The only thing that makes me sad is that I'm not there in person today. Well, it makes but us... I'm, I've been banned from the studio ever since I dropped my microphone it, into, the, into my coffee. You didn't drop it. Yes. It was me. I started that was Carter. <laughs> I did that on my own. Yeah. <laughs> See, I, you know, this is this is, introduces our topic today because we're going to talk about having the tough conversation. We all make mistakes. We all have weird things that happen. And how do we get past some of them? That's our topic. Sounds That's good. what I'm bringing to the party today. And I, I'm pretty sure it was me. You were just being kind. No, no, no. no I was it was Carter. your microphone and <laughs> pop right in your coffee, which then spilled over onto your Mac laptop, which Taylor grabbed, upended, and shook all the, the moisture off. But uh, we asked you if it we, was okay. We and you, you sweared it was, but I have no idea if, uh, if you're telling us the truth or not. Well, there was coffee karma because a few months later uh-huh. i ended up pouring a cup of coffee into my purse which had my computer in it and now i do have a new mac <laughs> uh, well <laughs> so there was a little Dang. coffee karma happening there that you know well, one way or the other i was getting a new computer that's right so i was gonna say i think that's what that was it. i think you just wanted a new computer <laughs> whoops <laughs> sorry <laughs> Well, whether Yay. you're whether you're here or not, we're glad you're with us. And yeah, uh, me too. Looking forward to the conversation. So, yep, yep. Tell us a little bit about have you, you you want to talk about having the difficult conversation? And I know that every business owner faces that moment where there's just not going to be a way around it. Maybe they've you know if they're like me, they've put off the difficult conversation because I like to avoid confrontation until it builds up a pretty good head of steam. And then I'm Mm -hmm. emotionally charged and can't help myself. And, you know, or if you're like Taylor, then maybe you don't wait quite as long. He's much better than I am at dealing with things quickly, but talk about that. It's a reality in any business owner's life that difficult conversations are going to have to happen. Right. Yes. And, um, you know, a little bit about my background. Let me let me kind of tell you why this particular topic is so um, important to me. Once upon a time as a kid, I was the fence testing kid troublemaking, you know, if, you know, I had a, I had about 50 jobs. I got fired a few times and you'll, you'll hear why, because if I showed up on day one and you said, okay, you got to start at eight o'clock, I would show up at eight Oh five to see if you had any integrity at all. (laughs) Okay. If, if that was real or not. So I have always been a, 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 a fence tester. So the few bosses that said to me, that's not going to fly. You have to show up at eight o'clock. I thought, okay, he means it. He's telling the truth here and I'll respect that. But most of the time it was from that point on, we were playing my game, not your game. So I share that because I can relate to your troublemaking fence testing employees. I feel like I am still that person at heart. Since then, I, you know, I married a plumber and I was um, the mom in a mom pop shop. And, and I uh, learned a lot from that experience. I almost sank the business. Thank goodness I found some great mentors like Frank Blau and all the other illustrious uh, uh, folks who are in our industry who share what they know. So I became a student of the industry and I got smarter, which was good. I was the president of Benjamin Franklin Plumbing for a couple of years and we grew very, very fast. And now I'm the the president of Zoom Drain, a drain and sewer franchise. And when it comes down to it, isn't it all about the people? Isn't it all about the people, either the customers or the the people who work for you? But isn't it all about relationships? It is. Yeah, and I think sometimes that, that business owners think that having relationships at work is somehow different than having relationships with friends and family. It's, yeah, it's, I, yeah, yeah, I it's like they're su- like at work. It's supposed to be different. We're not supposed to be human beings at work. You and know? someone will even say in kind of a derogatory way. Well, when I go to 
go to work, it's like, a, you know, having children. Well, what's wrong with having children? That does, that, that's a great analogy. Wouldn't it be nice if we created a, a community, a family at work, a place where we could trust one another and that we would help each other out? And there were rules and boundaries, both, both in your home and in your business. These are, these are good things. And they can help us avoid awkward uh, conversations, which we can touch on, as well as, you know, I'm going to give you some things I've learned along the way for having those conversations without it turning into a, a big shouting match or lots of drama or, you know, hurt feelings all around. You know, we don't always accomplish that. We may have relationship hiccups that we have to fix, but I, I've learned a few things that have worked for me and that's why I'm happy to share today. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about some of the, the situations that you see business owners get in where, uh, where having a uh, some rules and some guidelines for dealing with tough conversations comes into play. Well, here's a statistic that's probably totally made up. So here you go. Um, I heard this from Harry Friedman once upon a time. Have you ever heard of him? Great sales trainer, yeah. worked with the Nextar group a lot. He's awesome and had a big impact on my philosophy. Um, Harry Friedman said from stage once that 75% of all the corrections you make to team members are about things you never made clear in the first place. Oh, I, so, and I agree with that. Isn't that, doesn't that land? Yeah, yeah. Because sure, so. setting expectations and being clear, I mean, clarity is like huge. And we don't do that. We don't take the time to be clear. And I, and boy, that you can avoid a lot of hard feelings, hurt feelings, Absolutely. just by being clear. And so how do you make it clear? Pop quiz, fellas. How do you make it clear what is expected? What is good enough at any organization? What is good enough for you people? How would you communicate that? Well, hmm. we'll play some Jeopardy yeah. music. Well, one, one of the things that I do <laughs> is I like for them to tell, tell me what they heard. So that, okay, reflecting, reflective listening, yes. very good technique. Yes, I like it. Yeah. That, How else can you make things clear? Well, we we I I like to start with documenting as much as possible what what needs to happen in a particular situation. Ding 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 ding. So I that, love reflective listening, but writing things down is really the best way to make certain that what we're what we're communicating is now clear. Right. We go, go yeah. back to the written document. So this is what manuals are for. And my mentor and, and friend and partner in Zoom Drain is Al Levy. And Al Levy um, is really the one who sold me on the concept of operations manuals so that it, how do you answer the phone is written down um, what your job responsibilities are for your position is the table of contents for your manual. So if you're a service tech, what tasks are you responsible for doing? If you're an employee, is there an employee manual that every employee has that lays out what the vacation time is, when you're supposed to be here? And while this sounds a little exhausting, and it is, in the long run, it saves you so much time, energy, and awkward conversations if you're willing to take the next year and write your operations manuals or get a great guy like Al Levy um, to help you do that. It's sometimes easier to edit than start from scratch when it comes to this. But if you're going to build an organization that is going to be sane, that's going to allow you to um, uh, not spend time, energy, and money on the details every day, on the housekeeping every day, you're going to commit to the manuals. And that makes it clear what's good enough for you at your company. Well, it's in the book. That's going to be where we start. So as a result, what I don't talk about is attitude. I've got this, uh, I've got this issue with attitude. Now, this is a hot topic. Have you guys ever talked to, to someone, maybe a team member, about their attitude? It doesn't come mm, up a whole lot yeah. here, but, you know. I'm... Well, you guys are evolved. <laughs> Yeah, I always I, say that. You, you're just I, like, I mean, I think it's why we love each other. We have a, sh a lot of shared philosophy. But um, I, I think you've heard this as you talk to contractors, you know, hire for attitude. And um, uh, it's the attitude that matters. I talked to how to give this guy an attitude adjustment. And whenever I hear the word bandied about like that, I groan. 
Because attitude is like, there's like nothing I can do with that. If I'm a team member, like, you know, as a fence testing employee, my boss would come up to me occasionally and say, listen, Ellen, I don't like your attitude. And I'm thinking, well, my attitude's fine. I'm living the dream. I'm having fun. I didn't, I'm not experiencing whatever he is experiencing. And a word like attitude is what is going inside, going on inside my head. How could he possibly or she possibly know what's going on there? It's in your head. It's not, it has nothing to do. And that's why it doesn't come up here. It's like, you know, I care less about your attitude about something and more about your actions regarding what needs to be done. Exactamundo. So what we want to focus on uh, in order to prevent having awkward conversations that are unnecessary and to make the most sense of those times when we do have to have those conversations, let's focus on behavior, not attitude. So instead, if someone said to me, Ellen, you're showing up at 8.05 and start time is 8 o'clock. Are you clear on that behavior? It's right here in the manual. And this is your, uh, this is your, um, uh, verbal warning or rubble, rubber bullet or whatever we're going to use for our um, uh, uh, steps of correction, right? Steps of discipline, progressive mm-hmm. discipline are some words we use for this process. What I'm going to do with that is say, here's your warning. Next step is a written warning. Next step, you're going to get suspended without pay. And then the fourth step, if you're generous, is I'm going to show you the door. So I just want you to know that this behavior, if it continues, will head you to the door. I might at that point say, Ellen, is there something that's keeping you from being at work at eight o'clock? Um, uh, I don't have a car. All right. Can we problem solve that? Can you figure out a bus schedule? Do you need my help with that? Or can you figure it out? Because it's going to be required. I mean, they may have some legitimate reason. We had a, a kid once at a company I worked with who just couldn't show up clean. When the smoke cleared, he lived in a trailer with a whole bunch of other people and their plumbing didn't work. Well, as a result, the owner ended up as installing a shower at the shop. Now, that's a big, great idea for getting rid of a rock that may be in the road. So, you know, it doesn't have to be you just like laying down the hammer all the time. Discussing the behavior can lead to a realistic solution to a workable problem. Right. So it is okay during this conversation when you're correcting someone's behavior um, to to ask the question, why is there a reason why? Sometimes they just say, you know what, brain fart, just the alarm didn't go off, won't happen again, duly noted. And the conversation could be over. You would document that you had. This is kind of an oxymoron that I had a verbal uh, conversation. That was his first strike on being late. Okay, then you could document that. And if it happened again, you would have something in writing said, hey, we talked about this once on October 15th. This is your second transgression. Okay, we've got to fix this or you're going to lose your great job for not being here on time. So let's solve this problem. Or if you don't want to be here, you can make that decision. That's okay, too. We still love you. It's okay if you don't work here. But these, you know, clean, sober, on time, dressed right, and willing to use a checklist, that's what will ultimately get you fired if you don't do those things. I also think that when you have um, not only your handbooks and systems and things in place written down that you can point to, but also that you have your core values, you know, the things that are important to your company, the way that you're going to act and treat others. One of the things that I find is when you have those written down, the greatest thing about it is the owner's no longer the bad guy. All of a sudden, we play, we really play the part of coach of saying, hey, you know, you point to what's going on. You're able to instruct and not get angry. There's not a, You can back up and not have the emotion tied to it because you have the playbook. And this yes, is the playbook. Yes, yes. You know? I love, love, love that. Um, this, this is a, a way of thinking of it. It's creating a really great game. Another one of my mentors is Jack Stack, The Great Game of Business. And I, I love the idea of business as a game, is that we'll play games in life. And if you don't make the game 
accessible to me, if I don't know what the game is, we'll play my game, which may get me fired and you may not like, but if you had a better game than my game, I just might play. So what's the game? Well, every game has rules. It's okay to have rules. Good people like rules. In basketball and in the World Series, there are rules, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have a game. There's boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then there's rights. Not everything is in the manual. We're going to leave you free and clear to make some decisions. All right? Then there's going to be some rewards, consequences and rewards for doing a great job. If you do at least this much, this is what's required. This is good enough for us. If you exceed that, there's a sales bonus, a productivity bonus. We could, you know, we can create a game like that too, so that the reward can be commensurate with the production. And then the last bit is what you were just talking about is a reason. When the Simon Sinek is a friend of yours and mine, mm -hmm. um, he talks about starting with why. When the why is big enough, when the reason to be part of the community and the, the team and the family is great enough, people get over the, the things that they don't love. Like, you'll wear a scratchy uniform if the overarching mission of the company is it compelling enough. If the values resonate with yours, you'll wear the scratchy uniform. You'll get up earlier than you would want to. Everybody puts up with something they don't like. But I can't uh, over, uh, I, I want to really underline what you just said about having something more compelling than the rule book to play the game. The whole game is going to involve rights, rules, rewards, and a reason, a compelling reason to play. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. And, and a lot of owners miss that because yeah. they, they have this idea that, it's it's back to I have money, you have time. I'm trading money for time. So you come in, do what I say, and I give you money and go home and leave me alone. And, and, and they're working like crazy. I, you know, my my uh, partner in Zoom, Drain, he told me I, I he doesn't anymore, but he told me once upon a time, I hate my guys. I hate them. I'm there twelve to twenty hours a day. And when I walk in and I see them leaning against the truck, having a cigarette, and there's like a pile of trash in the parking lot, it looks like they're sabotaging my best efforts and I blow a fuse. So everybody loses here. And it could be that they didn't notice the trash or no one had asked them. It wasn't ever defined whose job that was. Mm -hmm. So we could go back to that. And it, it's also that you can't change them, but you could change you. And this was what made all the difference with Jim is instead of blowing his fuse, what he started to do was take a deep breath and walk around the building. Now, isn't that a good idea? Like before you blow your cork, just breathe, get some oxygen, bring your blood pressure down, walk around the building. Your mom used to tell you to count to 10. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> And then what is it that I'm doing? What is it that I could change that would change this outcome? What if I made it clear whose job it is to patrol the parking lot? What if we rotated through? Maybe this is an apprentice's job. And what if we solve that problem even better? What if I asked the guys to help me solve this problem? What he found is they were at the ready to help. He just never engaged them. Yeah. When you give somebody ownership to make changes and improve areas that they see need improving, it's amazing how they'll step up. Yeah. And they just, there wasn't, there was no reason to take initiative because it was never good enough for Jim anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. So all yeah. of this then creates this awkward, rough, tough conversation. And Jim, once upon a time, used to talk to a guy about your attitude and then say, what attitude? And then you'd get into the circular logic that made no sense. Mm -hmm. When you deal with behaviors, when you help people win the game, chances are their attitudes are fine, even though it's really none of your business. Like you probably know people like this. Maybe you are someone like this. I'll go to a shop I, as a consultant. This happened with, with some regularity. I'd go to a shop and, and the owner would say, I want you to ride with Bob. Bob has a terrible attitude. And my eyes would roll and I'd go, okay. So I'd ride along with Bob. And the whole way to the job, Bob is just like burning my ear with how much he hates his boss and his job and how everything's wrong and it sucks and blah, blah, blah. And what I'll try and do is just change the conversation to like, I'll see his kids on the dashboard. I'm just there to make a friend, right? And I take the, the criticism like a duck. I just want to get to know a little bit more about Bob while I'm on the ride along. But then what would happen is we'd show up at the customer's house. 
And Bob would put on his booties and hand the business card and big smile and how you doing and awesome uh, diagnosis, goes through the sales process, use the price book, sells a bunch of appropriate stuff. And then we leave with this super happy customer and a testimonial and then wine, wine, wine all the way back to the shop. So right. sometimes they're just letting off some steam. Yeah. Could we not react to everything? Yeah. And I'm going to ask you this question because one of the most interesting things I've ever had somebody tell me is that I feel like my guys and I are on opposite sides. And I asked mm -hmm. the question, I said, why? I said, I feel like, you know, I'm trying to hold on to as much money and they're trying to take as much money from me <laughs> as possible. And so this, this, it sets up this adversarial, um, mentality you know this uh, you know me against these guys and and which is so to me is like it doesn't make any sense because how can you build something if you're trying to build it with some somebody that you think's the enemy you know i think i think this goes back to you creating that that vision for them so the clearer you are i love the word clarity i love making it clear you know our communications clear and our vision clear so if you were to as the owner of the company spend some time considering what does this business look like three to five years from now how many trucks would we have? What would the shop look like? You could do a vision board. You could do an essay. You could, you know, uh, take pictures of, of things, you know, and you can write a business plan. Anything that helps you clarify your intention is good. And you might take, if, if you're a larger shop, you might take uh, a few of the key employees or influencers at your company, the managers together and say, this is what I see, right? And, and, and share that vision with them. And... What if you asked everybody on your team at some point in a ride along, in a side by side, when the two of you are walking around the building picking up trash, what if you ask them, you know, this is what I see in my future. This is the game I want to play and I'm creating. And it could be very useful to know your goals. Because if I knew what your goals were and what you wanted out of the next three to five years, it could be that we could help each other. Mm -hmm. And maybe that guy says, I want to start my own business. Maybe the guy says something like, um, I want a hunting rifle. And like the, the reaction could be, that's it. That's all you got. <laughs> but for a lot of people, no one's ever asked them, what are your goals? Where do you see yourself in the future? Or with a lot of our guys, somewhere along the line, someone said to him, you'll never amount to anything. You know, you're just a, a plumber, you're just a heating tech. You know, some of our team members, like all people, deal with self-esteem issues. They, they, they have had the, the dreams beaten out of them. Yeah. Yeah. So wherever they are in that process, if you made it a point to start asking, you know, what do you want? And perhaps while you're here, I could help make that happen. And while you're here, I could share my dream with you and you could help me too. And you know, because... That do you like that? It doesn't yeah. seem like that's connected to how to have difficult conversations. But <laughs> all of but, well, we're avoiding that so well, far. No, 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 no. I, I think it's absolutely related to and directly connected to the subject because the more groundwork you lay with your team, the more work you do to 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 demonstrate to them, hey, we're on the same team. We're moving forward. We're, we've got the same goals. We're, we have the same mission. We're driven by the same purpose. We have the same core values, and we're animated by those things in our business that, that get us you know, to where we all win. And the more you have those discussions with your team, the fewer difficult conversations you have to have you know, in the first place. I mean, or in the second place, you know, the, right. the, the more you do that. Yes, but we should probably, we should probably move on to, okay, there's still some things that are going to come up. All right. So all those things that we talked about are going, are, are good, uh, proactive uh, uh, ways that you can grow your business, share your, your goals, help a brother out. By the way, the book, The Dream Manager is a really good book. It's a little too long, like most business books are, and it's a little schmaltzy at times, but the message is great, which is to somebody at your team could create create a formal program for helping everybody on the team achieve a goal or two or three. It's, it's, a, it's a nice uh, study of that conversation. But let's, let's talk about a couple of difficult conversations. One would be, 
someone is breaking the rules, showing up late, um, not hitting their, their, their productivity or their sales goals, something to do with their overall performance on the job. And the second one could be, um, there could be a lack of shared vision at the, at the highest level of the company. And that's, that's a different one. Okay. So let's just start with the, uh, with the conversation, um, as far as someone is breaking the rules, if you don't have it written down, what you can do is say, you know what, my bad, I'm going to fall on my sword. I have not made clear this particular issue. So if you're just starting your manuals, what you would do is start with the employee manual and focus on what it means to show up clean, sober, on time, dressed right, and willing to use a checklist. Start with those basics. So what does clean mean? To put the uniform policy, the grooming policy in written form in your manual. Take a picture of them when they're in uniform. Say, you don't look like this. Start with the non-negotiable easy ones. On time, what does on time mean? Now with cell phones, it's great because everybody has the same time as opposed to the clock in the warehouse, right? Sober, have a, a, a drug and, and um an alcohol policy testing program in place so we can be clear on that. And then willing to use a checklist. If you use a checklist to uh, uh, do a dig job, there's a, a checklist before you start the job. If you don't use that checklist, you're going to get written up. So if you start with these basics, this is what you can go to the wall on. And as you put in each of these policies, you can then hold someone accountable to them. Between then and now, it's really a suggestion, and that's a tougher thing. So my encouragement would be for those those conversations, it gets very simple. You can ask, you can ask, is there a reason why? And he says, well, a wild zombie attacked me on the way to, to, to work today. Hey, stuff happens, and you can be human about it. <laughs> I don't know why you zombie. All right? But when you have the difficult conversation on something like that, here's a suggestion be, or a couple suggestions, behaviors only, refer to the manual, and no poop sandwich. A poop sandwich is, I love you, you're great, Can we go? but I hate you, you didn't show up on time, but I love you, keep up the good work. Just, just talk about what's wrong. And if you, if you would, on a regular basis, catch them doing things right, you won't feel so obligated to try a poop sandwich during the difficult conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Hey, Ellen, I got another question. Uh, okay. And I, I mean, this is, this I know is something that's going to resonate with a lot of our listeners and family owned businesses. Well, what if the person you have to have the difficult conversation with is someone, you know, in your family, a spouse that uh, you own the business with or a, mm -hmm. a child that works for you? What, talk a little bit about that. Well, and that's that second conversation. What if the vision isn't aligned? What if what they think and you think in terms of where we're going over the next few years isn't the same? This can happen in a family business. Suppose we have two brothers or, you know, let me go to my own experience. When Hot Rod and I were um, working together, husband and wife team, uh, at first it was so awful because we had no money. And until I fixed the money, honey, it was so stressful, so hateful. We were fighting all the time. I would say, we're not making enough money. And he would hear, I'm not good enough, right? You know, mm -hmm. it was just, it was so hard. Then once we got the money handled, I turned to my husband and I said, okay, you know, this is better, right? Now, what do you want? What do you want? Such a good question. What's your vision? Where are we going here? And he said, you know, I like working all by myself. Now, at this point, we've got four employees plus me plus him, and it's like, oh. So we decided to sell our company. Now, at the time, it was very stressful, but the important part was asking that question. Get the key people in place. Get the owners in place. Go on a little retreat and share your visions. And if they're not aligned, it doesn't make you a bad person. You do not have to work there. Now, in my situation, the business was his. There can only be, oh, this is so hard sometimes, one person at the top of the org chart. Now, there could be two 50-50 owners, but someone has to be the one who will sign off on the vision, right? And at some point, you have to decide if you can sign off on that vision, if you can get what you want while that person takes us in this direction, or if you've got to go. It, now, isn't, I mean, that's a heavy thing to just lay out there. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. But doesn't it make sense to be willing to have that conversation? And I, as a survivor of that conversation, I'm telling you, it's the best thing that ever happened to us because we wanted different things and nobody's wrong in the situation. We ended up selling our company to our employees, which was absolutely fabul fabulous. 25 years later, they're still rolling those trucks, which makes me so proud. And then Hot Rod went on to start a business of his own. I went on to Benjamin Franklin and consult. We both have had very exciting careers, but before we were holding each other back. And I know I was laying on him a lot of stuff that was just outside my hula hoop. If only he would change used to be my mantra. So at some point, a family member can leave. And if that's the encouragement you need, you've got a difficult conversation ahead. It's safest to do this in a resort, in a, a resort would be nice, in a retreat setting. Like, go away, say, let's have a conversation about the direction of the company. Let's make sure we're on the same page. I wrote the book, The Weekend Biz Plan, for that purpose. Like, it is a skinny book that just tells you, here's what you could do over a day and a half retreat. Put a little plan together. And if you and the key members of your, of your company went and did that, that would give you a chance to make sure you're on the same page huge. That's a different type conversation than, you know, somebody being late, but it's awkward. Yeah, yeah. that's so true. Now you're quiet. Give me some feedback. Uh, on no, I'm, we're, we're, I'm listening. I'm <laughs> imagining, you know, it's heavy, right? It is, but it's necessary <sighs> if you're going to move forward. One of the, one of the biggest reasons that we see businesses stay in that, you know, almost stalled out phase is because, there's not unity of the vision. There's not, there's not an agreement about who we are, what, why we exist and where we're headed. And so, uh, you know, working toward anything that you can do to work toward getting clear on that helps mm -hmm. to power the business in really amazing and profound ways. Without that, you flounder, you just kind of flop around. And one day you come in and, and, one person's vision rules the day. And then a week later, another person's vision takes the top spot and nobody knows what's going on. Everybody's guessing which one is it this week. And it just sabotages the energy of your people and the direction that you're headed. It splits the, the, the effort and the momentum in different directions and you get nowhere. It is, it is a tricky thing. And, and uh, when you are the, the person in charge, suppose on the org chart, you've been the one who says, okay, I'll lay claim to this top position. That is a, um, uh, that is in that position, you're going to have these moments where you can play the CEO card. You know what? We're going to do it my way because I am the boss. It's the responsibility I've assumed, and it's going to be my decision. You may be called on to do that as the leader of the company. There is always a price to pay for playing that card, right? Sure. It may be required, but you can't play it all the time. Because yeah. unless people feel like they are going to have their thumbprint on it, they are going to have an opinion that will be valued, you're going to end up with a dictatorship that isn't going to be all that much fun. I mean, ultimately, it isn't a democracy. You are the leader. But the paradox of leadership is that you engage the team. If your vision is compelling enough, then it's time to turn to the team and say, do you sign off on that? Can you get what you want out of life, at least for the time being, by helping the team get to this point? Is this a compelling game for you? And if it is, then day by day, we vote with our feet every day. Your team members come in, and then they get to work towards their goals while they work on yours. Now, that's a nice place to be. And if you're working towards a system-focused business, not a personality-driven business, meaning that we have manuals, we have systems, we can take a green person and, and bring them up the ranks from the bottom of the org chart to a, a senior position and teach them help them develop and grow the skills they need to be successful. Then if someone leaves, the train doesn't come off the rails. You, you know, the, the, it doesn't make someone a bad person just because they don't work for you anymore. God bless them. Maybe they win the lottery. Maybe they always wanted to start their own business. Maybe they wanted to be an artist and now they finally can be. That's all wonderful. And if you know that, then you can work together without some kind of weird unwritten pressure that you're like, what, never allowed to leave? 
never allowed to have a dissenting opinion, never allowed to complain about anything. I saw General Honoré, Russell Honoré speak at when I was, I spoke at Harvard, which was a huge honor. I'm oh, sorry, this was at West Point. I spoke at West Point and Honoré was the keynote speaker. He and Buzz Aldrin, what a great day. But when General Honoré was um, speaking, he's the guy who made some sense of the disaster in New Orleans, right? He came down after the initial botched rescue and got things moving again, got people moving, supplies moving, and turned it back from a war zone to a rescue effort. Really interesting guy. But he said that when you're in a situation that looks impossible— The most important thing, going back to what you said, Carter, early on, the most important thing is to get everybody on the team to look at the horizon. What's the main thing here? What is our mission here? And then the problems and the projects take their scope. So as a leader, being really clear on where we're going as a, you know, to be a good community member, to generate so much in sales so that we can provide this much for our, our employees, to demonstrate at Zoom, our, our, our mission is to demonstrate the best that business can be. We see business as a, as a vehicle for expanding peace, prosperity, and freedom across the, the globe. And why don't we be the best one we can be? So as you paint the picture of what the best you know, uh, what the horizon looks like, things like, I don't like the uniform, take their scope. I'm not saying that wouldn't be a great project to overhaul your uniforms, but don't let it derail us from that mission. Then that makes it easier to have conversations. Like if you get stuck, we're, we're at loggerheads, we can't come up with a solution to this particular problem. Or we ran into this with Zoom when we were updating our logo. And it got really, I had a lot of passionate people involved in this project and it, I, you know, it can't derail what we're doing here. My job as the leader was to continually point out, all right, our bigger picture here is to demonstrate the best that business can be, to get to hundred million in sales, to expand in a hub and spoke way so that our team members have all this opportunity. We can figure out the logo, can't we? And we did. So very often the difficult conversation becomes less problematic when the leader reminds the team of the of the mission and that you know if you're continually banging that drum i think that's the leader's job that's the president's job is to bang the drum of the ideal and then to be willing to let the team members solve the problems play the game that will help you move in that general direction we're out of time aren't we uh, we I'm are looking at the clock it's- oh that's a great place to leave it though it's it starts with the vision it starts with where we're headed and then asking that question can you buy into this can you is this a game you're willing to play and uh and and then moving forward in that spirit it's really good that's that's awesome and well and it's it's always about the people you guys are awesome i want to give a shout out to my team at, at zoom drain i you know as i've been talking about them and telling the stories i uh, they are the wind beneath the wings here. And as a team, we're creating some really cool things happen. Happen. The systems are, are part of it. Ultimately, it's all about the relationships and the love, love, love. And you guys are, you're all about that. I always feel the love that you have for your community, not just your team members, but for all of us in the, in the blue collar world. So thank Absolutely. you for taking thank us you. with you. Thank you. And that. I know people are going to want to connect with you, Ellen. Where's the best place for them to do that online? They can go to ellenroar.com, E-L-L-E-N-R-O-H-R. If they want to learn more about Zoom Drain, they can go to zoomdrain.com. Awesome. Thank you Yay. very much for being on. Thanks, Ellen. Okay. Love you guys. Mwah, mwah, mwah. You too.